Thank you for joining us on TV3. I'm Jifa Bampo. Today I'm speaking to the Information Minister, Kojo Ponkroma. Uh, the government machinery has just launched a new anti terrorism campaign called the See Something, Say Something campaign. It's being driven by the Ministry for National Security as well as the Ministry of Information. Let's now speak with the Information Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Oponkuma, and thank you. thank you for your time. Thanks. So this campaign has been launched today. What duration of time are we looking at for this campaign? Initially, we are hoping to ramp up um, a lot of awareness in the first three months. And then, of course, the intensity most likely will come down, but hopefully will be sustained uh, through our partnerships with the media, faith-based, and other organizations. Uh, and then as we move along in the years to come, we hope to uh, keep the message occasionally bursting into the public conversation so that awareness is sustained. Mm. Now, is the campaign going to target specific communities? Because we see an asymmetrical movement of the violent extremists or terrorists coming from up north, down south. We've seen attacks in Cote d'Ivoire, in Burkina Faso, and in Togo. We seem to be ring-fenced. What's the plan? Well, part of our plan is to substantively prepare um, and deal with the risk or the threat of uh, violent extremism and terrorism. And that means um, preparing our security institutions, preparing our intelligence, uh, institutions preparing the general public uh, so that among other things level of awareness is heightened uh, and the various parts of the ecosystem that must be primed to respond should there be a challenge are also uh, put in readiness. Uh, part of it also is to generally uh, move into the new dimensions of security. Modern security requires that you engage a lot more and not keep things under wraps as though they were top secret uh, matters and in that light you are seeing us frontally engage the country, open up, explain the nature of the risk and the threat, uh, and recruit the public uh, through this national mobilization exercise. Because if anything is to be learned from some of the crises that the world has gone through, when you have a crisis, you need to mobilize uh, all of the republic to be able to get a robust response. And that's, that's, that's where we are currently. So this to mobilize a, a collective response of all Ghanaians, but we do know that there are some flashpoints in our country, particularly in the Upper East region. We still have the Boku chieftaincy crisis. Uh, we recently saw attacks in the Binduri uh, constituency area. Will you be targeting specific uh, hotspots? Yes, we would. There's a general national conversation and campaign, but there's also the need to do direct engagements with what we call vulnerable areas. Um, the, the intelligence and the theory tells us that often persons who want to use violent extremism as a tool to advance their cause, they look for what we call already existent fault lines. So where there may be ethno-religious conflicts, where there may be uh, economic uh, challenges that is causing people to rise up sometimes in arms or in agitation, where there may be political conflict, so it is not just about uh, places or flashpoints uh, in geographic areas. It is also about where you may find other fault lines. Sometimes it's a basic chieftaincy matter. And that could be anywhere in the south, in the middle belt, or in the north. And indeed, the data shows us that there are a lot of chieftaincy hotspots across our country. Uh, the data also tells us that these persons are interested in mineral-rich areas where law enforcement is weak, so that they can get access to minerals and be able to improve their own finances and further advance their cause. And there's a lot of it in our um, ecosystem here in Ghana. So it's important that um, we tackle that without necessarily just looking out for you know, areas of the north, etc. Um, in addition to areas of um, you know, mineral availability and weak law enforcement and areas of uh, fault lines, you are also looking at places where sometimes education levels are very low so that it's easy to indoctrinate people. Now, if you cast all of that on the map of Ghana, that's literally the whole landscape. So yes, there are flashpoints or there are areas of uh, vulnerability that we are interested in, but we're also interested in the whole uh, uh, landscape of Ghana because uh, it's a threat that we face everywhere. In terms of encouraging people to say something when they see something, how do we know 
that some unscrupulous individuals will not take advantage of the sit uh, situation to profile specific people or to accuse people they don't like and then they will get caught up in a whole different situation. Yeah. First of all, we are not asking people to take the law into their own hands. What we're asking people to do is to have a heightened sense of awareness. And people need to be aware of something specific. What is that something specific? We're asking people to look out for uh, people who are mobilizing and seeking to exploit fault lines. I've heard some commentary that says that look out for foreigners. We're not saying look out for foreigners because sometimes these people are citizens. They are indigents of our local communities. So when we say look out for something, we are saying that look out for things out of the ordinary um, within our ecosystem. Things that deal with attempts by people to radicalize or mobilize uh, Ghanaians to attack either people or institutions or to change the kind of mindset and hospitable mindset that we have in pursuance of a certain radical agenda. And we're saying that when you observe these things, draw the attention of security agencies or community leaders to it. We are not saying take the law into your own hands, but draw their attention. Now they have the ability to do the proper intelligence assessment then the intelligence and security agencies will make the necessary preemptive or preventive interventions. The number to call, we're told, is 999. That's one of the numbers. I'm one of the numbers. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, prank calls? Well, Certainly that would worry because I know that the fire service and the Ghana police service yeah. complain about receiving Indeed, a lot of prank our calls. our National Information Contact Center also receives a lot of uh, uh, prank calls. Prank calls are part of the global um, you know, may I say, downside of uh, creating emergency hotlines. It happens everywhere else in the world. But um, I guess there's infrastructure in place to ensure that when a particular number does a number of prank calls, that number can be disabled from actually getting through uh, the next time. We are also very serious about people who may want to use this as a period to perpetuate misinformation or disinformation because... How, how is that uh, a danger? Now, this particular subject of terrorism is such that it's not like any other bit of false news or misinformation or disinformation. This will be false news that will cause fear and panic. And so we are quite clear that any persons who also take advantage of this window to seek to, uh, you know, just throw things out there to cause undue fear and panic within the Ghanaian population must be, um, you know, dealt with in accordance with the laws that exist. That is not about press freedom or about freedom of expression. Because if you do it particularly with that objective, and that objective can be subjected to the test uh, to uh, be determined. Some sanctions must follow so that we can protect the space for uh, free expression, the space for uh, truth, the space for people who want to provide genuine information. If there. I'm on a platform and I receive the information, yes. the person also received it from elsewhere. Oh, then you are not susceptible. I mean, you are not culpable. Yes, but what I mean is... The truth is, it's a lot of the, these disinformation yeah. or false. Pops up on platforms. They pop up on on WhatsApp and platforms, is, social media yeah, platforms. That is why, as part of the education generally on um, digital communications and misinformation, we have been saying that don't just be in the business of forwarding things that you have received because you will be held culpable. You are responsible for that broadcast that has taken place. If you go ahead just forwarding things that you haven't verified, if you have no way of verifying and validating and knowing that it is true, do not be in the business of just sharing it uh, out there because if it is found to be material that has been broadcast to cause fear and panic you the one who put it out there will be held capable for it there's a question about our security preparedness our military is considered one of the best in the world uh, the uh, the territorial integrity of Ghana has not been breached significantly um, for a long time what are the odds that, one, we are going to be breached, and then, two, that our security apparatus would be ready? If you just observe the trends and the data over the last five or six years and the, um, the direction that these difficulties are going into, just a reading of the trends will tell you that we are not in a good place, we are not in a good time. Four years ago, when we, are, you know, when we had assumed office, if you looked at the Burkina Faso map, it was only about, I think about 10, 5% of northern Burkina Faso that had extremist activity there. Today, almost 70, 80% of Burkina Faso is rife with extremist activity. It even led to 
uh, a weakening of the administrative state and a coup d'etat that uh, you know followed there. And day in and day out, the attacks are getting a lot more sophisticated. Just quite recently, northern Togo, just about 50 kilometers from Ghana's borders, if you read the report on the kind of attack that was staged, even including women as part of the combatants, the kind of ammunition that they were using, it tells you where the challenges are drawing towards. And all the things that uh, are around us tell us that we need to be a lot more careful uh, than we have been over the years. Hope and wish is not a strategy. We need to be a bit more uh, proactive in how we deal with the situation, and that's one. Now, we can do a lot better, that's my second point, in terms of our security architecture and in terms of our ability to uh, respond even to the risk. We can do a lot better in terms of mobilizing our people because not many people are conscious and aware of these risks and what they ought to do. You see people at football games, at the mall, at churches or mosques, and they are not necessarily security conscious. And we need to do a lot better in that area. We need to do a lot better in terms of uh, having more intelligence and security assets on the ground in terms of personnel and logistics. And all of that, for example, costs a lot of money. We have done a lot in the last three, four years in ramping up personnel and logistics, but we need to invest a lot more uh, in the security architecture of this country. Uh, we're speaking to the Information Minister, the Honorable Kujo Oponkuma. He's been telling us about the See Something, Say Something campaign, uh, which is an initiative of the National Security Ministry, driven as well with the support of the, Nash, uh, of the Ministry of Information. And uh, now I'll just speak to him about a few uh, important national issues. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Nkrumah, for a bit more of your time. Let's address a few more uh, pressing issues of national importance. There's a crisis of food, a crisis of cost of living currently in the country. Recent inflation figures for food uh, demonstrate as significantly um, high what are your preliminary thoughts on that? I mean, I think anybody who tries to pretend that um, we are not in difficult times may not even be a good pretender. Times are hard for people all over the world and here in Ghana because of a number of events that have occurred at the same time. Um, uh, inflation is a 40-year high in, in Europe, here in Ghana. Uh, I think this is the last is the or the first in, time in 18 yes, years or so that we hit yes, about 23% um, uh, percent, uh, primarily because of what's happening around the Black Sea area between Russia, um, you know, Ukraine and a few other um, you know, countries involved in that battle and how other countries are responding to fuel supply issues there. It's also coming at a time when global supply chain uh, linkages have been significantly hit on the back of the lockdowns that happened during the COVID era. So it's a lot of things happening at the same time, not, not, not necessarily uh, positively. One of the things that is really, or two of the things that really hit us are fuel and fertilizer. We have high food inflation. Yes. The fertilizer challenge has been around for quite a while. Yeah. But for the last five years, your administration has been implementing the planting, the planting, for, planting for food and, food and jobs. And jobs. Yeah. And so, so how is it that we have a crisis of food so, if we've been successful at so, this? So we did some work with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture to first examine whether the quantities produced had reduced. The data as uh, provided from the Ghana Statistical Service on the growth numbers for 2021 suggested that the growth of 2021 was heavily driven by an increased output in food items. Agro inputs have become more expensive. Agrochemicals, fertilizers, and other things that you need, even fuel. Um, and consequently, once you start having that, other prices on the farm, even including labor and cost of renting, you know, plowing machines and harrowing machines, all now begins to go up. So you have stocks, but the stocks have come at a very expensive price. If by the time it gets on the market, you have a fuel challenge, a fuel price challenge, like what we are having now, then you begin to see that prices are going way higher than what you would have ordinarily expected. And that's how come you're seeing the 30-something percent that you're seeing. One of those measures uh, that government, for example, has decided on is to actively 
uh, engage in the provision of organic fertilizer onto the Ghanaian market. It requires a lot more in terms of volumes. It requires some more time. But in the medium term, it is one of the ways by which we can ensure that even as stocks are maintained on the market, we are able to halt, if not reverse, the price of um, those inputs. Another area that government has been um, looking at is the uh, way of ensuring that the stocks are not quickly depleted. So storage. storage, storage of whatever we produce. Storage, and um, we've done, I, I think the last time we checked about 80 new warehouses to help ensure that storage is better. But also alongside that, if you look at our borders, there's been a lot of export of some of our food products that we have produced because of the kind of trade that we've been you know, having around us. And that's why you notice that quite recently, an, uh, I think an executive instrument was issued to proscribe the export of grains. The quantities are there, but the prices are high, and you allow a lot of export of it, and the quantities for the prices will go a bit But uh, is higher. that what we've suffered? Because if we've produced significant grain, we would not have the kind of crisis we are suffering. We also have to encourage um, a lot more investment in alternatives. There are wheat varieties that do very well in our part of the world. It creates an opportunity for us to go heavily into the production of some of those items to balance out in terms of the pricing and the availability difficulties that we are having uh, from um, that part of the world. Fuel is another matter. Government has already taken some steps hoping to halt what initially was a very quick escalation of the fuel pricing. We continue to examine whether or not we can do more so that as the challenges hit globally, we can at least mitigate the impact here on the Ghanaian uh, public. The Bank of Ghana is using monetary policy instruments, hiking up um, the rates. For many people, it's worrying because what it means is that the cost of credit will also go up at a time when already even capital for farming is high. And therefore, you are looking at how to ensure that that doesn't go too high. So can you um, de-risk uh, financing for agriculture and do it in a way that ensures that the institutions that support agriculture can still fund, find funding at a low rate. Thankfully, the Development Bank is here. Agriculture is one of their priority areas, and they should therefore be able to channel out some money for financial institutions that want to uh, finance or fund farming without necessarily going for some of these high rates that we are looking at. Uh, just to wrap up, yes, it is true. These are hard economic times globally and locally cost of food, cost of fuel, uh, cost of capital going through the roof. Governments are uh, called upon at this point in time, it is our responsibility to do the best we can to try and halt, if not pull back, uh, you know, uh, the situation. The government of Ghana has taken some early steps. Uh, we are of the view that it has helped to mitigate, but we continue to examine if we can do more uh, to alleviate the kind of difficulties that people are going through. And in so doing, it was in, I think, April or May that the Minister for Finance announced emergency measures uh, agreed at the special retreat in a bid to burden share. Yes. Um, any updates on the uh, deductions that were agreed uh, from the salaries of, you know, ministers? Yes, those deductions have started. But in addition to those deductions, the budgets of ministries, departments, and agencies have also been slashed. In fact, just this week, myself and my technical team were going through um, what the reduction of our budgets by 30, in some cases 35%, if you look at CAPEX, etc., what it means for our programs and activities this year, and how we have to cut back on all of um, those ones. It may be early days yet to begin to see the fiscal um, you know, impact of that. I'm sure the controller will be able to provide some more um, you know, details maybe by quarter three, getting to quarter four, but it has started. But you see, Jifa, the kind of broader economic challenge that we have will not only be resolved by some fiscal cutbacks. Oh, certainly not. Yeah. But I think one of the concerns people had was they want to see what is the quantum amount, and so they wanted that to be put in a separate account, and then they can be sure that it is targeted at this initiative. Then people can draw that uh, triangular correlation and be sure that the funds have been used I understand that and I'm sure that the controller will be able to provide some data maybe by quarter three, um, quarter four moving forward. I was only making the point that the broader economic challenge that we have 
requires, yes, fiscal measures, yes, monetary measures, but also requires us to do a lot of, um, what I'll say, development economic measures that enable us to tap into some of the global opportunities at very low cost um, to us and find also other ways of um, you know, developing alternatives to the things that are also costing us um, so much. And I'm hopeful that all of us, as we continue to engage and examine uh, the impact of what is being done, will do some more uh, to get the results we are looking for. The cost of food crisis has also hit school feeding caterers yeah. in the country, and they've been on strike for two weeks. We've not heard anything concrete from the Ministry of Gender under which ministry this issue sits. Is this something that you can give us a view about how it's being dealt that, with? I do know that Madam Cecilia Dapa, who's a caretaker uh, minister, has been uh, correlating a lot with uh, the finance minister to ensure that uh, whatever arrears exist in that area can be quickly settled so that the burden that is on many of our women caterers across the country. I was in my constituency just last weekend. I met a number of, uh, you know, caterers who were lamenting that we have cooked for about two terms, payments have not come in, schools have reopened, we have to start cooking, we are in debt, and we have to settle our debts and uh, move on. And I was at pains trying to explain to them the kind of fiscal difficulties we have been through uh, and how it is being gradually resolved. I know that the Minister and the Minister of Finance are working to ensure that that areas are cleared, those areas are cleared quickly, and then we can move on. But Jifa, that goes back to one of the conversations we've always been hiding from as a country. Our domestic resource mobilization quantums have been low. We need, I mean, there's so much demand. Today we are spending, I think, like one CD per child per day. It's 93 pesos to be specific. It's not even up to a CD. The school feeding caterers yeah. are demanding something up to two CDs. In fact, the president, the president has been asking why can we not increase the amount so that in terms of the nutrition and in terms of the coverage of schools, because not every school that is covered even currently with this one. But if you look at the budget that even this about one CD comes to, and you look at how much money we're able to mobilize um, if you expand it some more now or increase the amounts now, you'll be creating more difficulties than exist already. So we've got to start off by boosting the inflows so that what all of us want, which is expanding the coverage or even increasing the amount or possibly doing both, can be done. And that's why I said it goes back to part of our conversation that we've been having in this country that we need to really step up our domestic resource mobilization efforts so that we can have more resources to do more uh, for our people. So Parliament is back it raises the question also of the future of the gender ministry mm. and who leads it. Yeah. Currently, the Honorable Dapa continues to double up in that position. Yeah. But the Sanitation and Water Ministry is a whole different I kettle know, of fish I know. She's on its own. Is government going to review whether uh, the Honorable Sarah Ajoasafo continues in that position as gender minister? I'm not able to uh, preempt the president's actions. I can speak to the fact of what has happened in Parliament, where I think uh, a referral has been made to the Committee on Privileges, and that committee is expected to sit. My understanding is that the committee is affording uh, all the persons, including the, a member of Parliament for Domi Kwabinya, an opportunity to uh, put up their own answer in their own defence, and then, like the standing orders and the Constitution say, that the committee will make a decision for Parliament. Um, on whether they find those explanations as tenable or not. But that's separate from Honorable Sarah Jasa for not being or acting as minister uh, since last year. That is true. The appointee is the president, and I know you've indicated that that's really up to him. But isn't this a matter of concern? The gender ministry is a significantly strategic no, it is, one. It is a matter of concern on multiple fronts. Yes, you are right. The gender ministry is a strategic one. Uh, of significance that must be attended to, and that's why the president has uh, um, asked the minister for um, um, uh, sanitation to double up um, on that so that work does not unduly suffer at that ministry. But you also have to balance that concern with um, the honorable ministers or the substantive ministers' other concerns, which initially led to her um, going on leave and then the extension of, 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 of her leave. It's a balancing act that you have to so um, should we say categorically now that she's still on leave? Well, um, as far as I know, you recall the last statement that came from um, the Office of the President was that the leave had been extended um, and then the caretaker minister had been put in. I'm just saying that uh, you have to balance the kind of empathy and care that you show to a colleague who is having some difficulties.
I cannot preempt the president's next actions on that one, but um, I do know that it is a matter of concern to him. And in striking that balance, he will act in what is in the best interest of the ministry, what is in the best interest of the Republic, and also at the same time ensure that uh, the conditions of the Honourable uh, Minister are also dealt with. My final question uh, to you, Honourable Minister, has to do with media. So I know you set up the Safety uh, Office the for Journalists. For the yes, it's journalists. a very long name. Yeah. So I just call it the Safety <laughs> Office. Yes. So in March... Yeah. I did send a reporter there to check on how things were going. There was no one there. I'm learning that investigative journalist Anas Arimiyawa Anas has also set up, for want of a better term, a parallel um, setup similar to the safety office. What, what do you, how do you feel about that? Because well, it may create a to, certain perception. You no, know, we have to do a lot more for the safety of journalists than we are doing now. Yesterday, I had a meeting with some of our stakeholder groups, uh, like uh, UNESCO, etc. A lot of us are talking about it, but when you invite stakeholders to the table, that let us collectively do something about it. Um, not many of us are putting our money where our mouths are. We've set up a coordinated mechanism for the safety of journalists under the National Media Commission. The National Media Commission has provided a clear budget for what they need to be able to do this. There's a lot of public education that is required. People attack radio stations because for some of them, they don't understand that the media has a right to express a view on whatever you are doing. Look at what happened in Benya FM. Look at what happened at Radio Adan. These are not acts by state actors. These are acts by citizens who need a lot more education um, to, 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 to know the role of media in the society. Apart from education, you need some more robust law enforcement that when people are arrested, like what's happened in uh, Elmina uh, at Radio Benya, I understand that they've been granted bail. It does not become what we call in Ghana a foolish case as time goes along, and that people are really punished for acts of this nature. Now, all of these things under the ambit of the Coordinated Mechanisms Office requires some support to be able to execute. Government has been only been able to provide some minimal support. Many of the other stakeholders, very, very minimal support. But we have to do a lot more so that we can give a more robust response in dealing with the matter of security, um, you know, associated with journalism. So Anas's setup uh, does not undermine I what don't think so. you've I don't done. Think so. I don't think so. I think that, you know, uh, the more the merrier. If there are multiple organs, organizations that are willing to collaborate and to help, uh, so that we even keep an eye on what everybody's published. I'll give you an example. In terms of data, sometimes you have CSOs publishing some data which data may not necessarily correspond with the official record, but that data is what may be picked up by RSF and counted against the Republic. If you have three or four bodies that are all keeping an eye on this subject, you can even begin to cross-reference the data and have some more clarity. So I, you know, um, commend that exercise. I think it's complementary and is a kind of collaboration and support that we need so that we can do more and deal with this issue. Right. Thank you very much, Honourable Minister, Thank for you, speaking to us at TV3. You. Uh, you've been watching the Honourable Kojo Ponkoma, our Minister for Information there, addressing various issues of national importance. I'm Jifa Bampo. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.